You're welcome back. It's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. And uh, like I said, we're going to uh, still talk about some money matters. This time is the value added tax of 7.5% on diesel. Uh, that we, Subsidy seems to be flying out from everywhere, you know. Now, fend for yourself. Our country will be great again. I'm not really taking the words of uh, Donald Trump, but make Nigeria great again, as it were. We are being joined at this time uh, by Mr. Shegun Shokwiton, a principal partner, Woodridge and Scott Consulting. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning, Yambro. Um, thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, we're still here in the studio with uh, Mr. Bolahon Olajide, who graciously has stayed back to still uh, look into this issue as well. Tell us how much you know about the value-added task a tax rather that is going to be on diesel and how you think it's going to impact the economy mr shopwiton okay uh yeah thanks well um this is actually not really new it's a policy that has been um approved since uh, 2021 thereabouts um, um however uh, for reasons that we may just have to guess, uh, implementation did not commence until just you know, uh, this week, as confirmed um, by the Nigerian Customs Service. Uh, so what's happened is that there's a, there's, a, there's a VAT list and there's a VAT exemption list. Um, and in the um, tariff code called the HS code of the Nigerian Customs Service, there are certain items that um, have been exempted from different types of tariffs and taxes. And, AGO was, petroleum products generally was on, you know, this list of exemptions up until a particular time. And then there was a, a tariff order that was issued in 2021 that removed AGO from that list. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I think fortunately for Nigerians, that was not implemented. But this week, it's, you know, uh, the customs has announced that implementation is going to commence or has commenced on, on um, the, the non-exemption of AGO from that uh, VAT exemption list. What this means basically is that um, the 650 to 700 that you currently pay at the pump or diesel will go up by about 50 naira thereabouts. If you just do the calculation, just 7.5% of that current price, you know. Um, so in implication wise, what this simply means is that, you know, there's, there's an additional pressure on the, um, the disposable income of the average Nigerian is an additional pressure on um, the revenues or profitability of corporates and small businesses that rely on diesel. We recognize that the majority of, um, or should I say, the, a larger portion of diesel consumption in Nigeria goes for business uses. Very few people have diesel-powered cars. There are diesel-powered cars. But majority of diesel vehicles are large, high-duty vehicles that are usually used for transportation and other heavy-duty activities. So this will put pressure on profitability of businesses. And, you know, of course, that will be transferred, um, you know, to consumers one way or the other inadvertently. So it's an additional pressure point on Nigerians and on Nigerians' pockets, as it were. Uh, I would have thought that it would have been better to harmonize a lot of these policy pronouncements. See, there is a lot going on at the same time right now. Uh, from the monetary side, from the foreign exchange side, uh, the CBN is trying to manage inflation and is battling the issue of uh, monetary policy rates and trying to decide whether or not to increase or to reduce or to hold the NPR. Um, exchange rate has just been liberalized. Um, and then, of course, as we all know, the famous subsidy removal, it's a lot going on on both the fiscal and the, and the, and the monetary side of uh, government policy. Um, if you look at the Presidential Advisory Council report of this current president, um, there, there, there are very interesting plans regarding harmonization of monetary and fiscal policies of the government. Um, I wonder why those plans are not being implemented in line with what is contained in that document. I wonder why these policy pronouncements are coming almost disparately and independently. It would have been good, especially from an investor confidence point of view, to see some 
coherence and coordination in the manner in which these announcements are being made. Um, so hopefully we will get to see a bit more of that maybe when the cabinet appointments have been announced, you know, and all of that. But for now, um, there's just a bit of uncertainty. And that would explain to some degree why the volatility that you guys were talking about earlier is being observed in the, in the forex markets. There's, there's simply too much going on. And, and the markets are, if you like, just to use the word, a bit confused. So things will settle down hopefully and we'll see what direction these policies will lead us. But for now, I would have suggested that we take it easy a bit and ensure that there's a bit more coordination in the implementation of these policies. Okay, just taking from uh, the final word that he just said now, um, seems as if we're biting more than we can chew at the moment because <laughs> no, nobody will care if, if the entire world is owing us so long as you're still going hungry every night. Nobody cares how much money we make. And it seems as if everything this administration is doing is to drive the revenue process to make sure we have more money and to what end if people are still suffering. So do you think we're biting more than we can chew? Um, right it's, um, it's a whole lot to bite at a time. Uh, but my take will be if we're going to go that route, biting so much, the plan to handle it must also be robust enough. Um, most of these plans have not exactly been shared. But yes, um, uh, Mr. Shopwiton spoke about the Advisory Council report. There's a report mm. um, which shared some of these plans, actually. That report, I think about 50-page report. Um, mm. and, and you can see um, part of what the government intends to do. However, as it is today, we need um, more coordination. We need champions. So if I'm, if I'm talking of the monetary policy, for example, I'd like to know who is the champion of this policy? Mm. Who is the face of this policy? Who communicates with me about this policy? Who takes the feedback from me about this policy? As it is today, there is none, really, because we, we, we don't have a CBN governor in place, as it were. Mm. Uh, there's an acting person there, but I'm not even sure if he has made a single pronouncement um, you know, regarding this matter. There's no finance minister. So on the monetary, on the fiscal side, I don't know who my champions are. So I'm relying on, on, on a report by the Advisory Council, for example, which is not... It's, it's a good report, too. In fact, it's something that every Nigerian needs to go and take a look at because most of these policies, most of these... Several things that we said we are biting at the same time are actually encapsulated in that particular report. Yeah. But I would like to see the champions, people who can communicate with confidence and show the people. You know, when you're telling people we are going, this is where we are going, they also like to see a champion who is in charge of that. Mm -hmm. And if it is somebody they feel they can trust, it helps them. It even helps people who are watching us from the outside to know that, oh, these guys, yes, uh, they, they know exactly what they are doing, and this is the plan. This is how they intend to achieve it. So maybe, maybe in a time not so long, we will have that cabinet in place, and that it will be round pegs and round holes, so that we can begin to see more of that coordination. Sometimes, even if there's some coordination at the back, people still want to see it at the front end. And we are not seeing much of that for now. Um, Mr. Shopin had spoken about why, um, how come we have not implemented the VAT all this while yeah. since 2021. One of the reasons, this is me just looking at that particular market, could be that at, in 2021, there were price issues. So there was a time we saw a, a diesel went all the way from 200 to 800 to 850. Mm when the uh, war in Ukraine started over a year ago. So that same price had, had started to crash. I was looking at the ex depot price for diesel, and one of the uh, uh, depots was advertising 550. And I asked myself, um, this is definitely a good thing. Something has happened to the price of diesel. It could also be that window that something has happened to the price of diesel that the government is now looking at to say, look, ah, if that thing has moved from 850 and it's now at uh, 600, why don't I use the opportunity to put in this 7.5? But it would be better if it is communicated in a coordinated manner. 
we're doing this, this is where we're going. Is with the time frame not too short to draw that uh, line I, and say, I, okay? I, I understand this issue of uh, time frame, but I, I prefer to approach it from more of a detailed plan than the time frame issue. It's not, it's not everybody that will agree with you that they would rather you do this, you do one now, huh? No, no, then six no, months, you come talking, back to me not, again and say... I'm not even talking about that. Yeah, I'm not even talking about that. Uh, you, you just said it's conjecture. You just said it's supposed that maybe it's because the price of diesel crashed and then they want to take the opportunity. But between the time they, uh, the price of di uh, diesel crashed and this time that they want to take the opportunity, is it not too short for them to say they have studied the market so much that if they take this opportunity, it will not result in the people even suffering more? No. It's an opportunity that must be taken at that right time. It's one of the problems we had with subsidy removal, why it became an albatross on us. There was a time in the life cycle of oil in the international market where the price of a barrel of oil was zero. People were even willing to pay for you. Come and take this thing off this vessel so that I don't have to continue to pay storage fees. We did not remove mm. subsidy in those years. We waited until oil prices started to pick up and achieve some high prices. And that is the time we are trying to remove subsidy. It is part of the pains we are feeling, as it were. So you must also seize the moment. But that statement that I make, that was me trying to read the minute to why they are putting the 7.5 now. Mm. It would have been better if there is a champion out there whose responsibility is the, to communicate why what is what at a particular time. Not me. I'm okay. not. I don't work for government. Okay, well, <laughs> Mr. Shopperton, well, the government, uh, they have an advisory council. They're okay, we agree. But there will be ministers. There will be people put in place to run this process. And I'm not sure a right-thinking minister will just come take everything hook, line, line and sinker. They will tinker some, uh, with some of these things that they have, they have put in place now. Um, so do you, see, do you see a change to the policies that are now being implemented, so to speak, or now being pronounced, right, rather, uh, when the cabinet is officially formed? Um. I wouldn't expect too much change, and I think this is absolutely critical. Look, one of the problems that we've suffered um, over the years, especially you know the last eight years um, of the past administration, was a lack of coherence and a lack of um, proper communication of uh, the actions and the plans of the government with regards to the different sectors of the Nigerian society, whether you talk about economic, managing the economy, whether you talk about the security situation, even the anti-corruption fight, supposed, there simply was no adequate communication and there was no clarity as to what the exact plan was. Where were we going as a country? So it's a, it's a, it's a good thing that we, um, it's a departure from past practice where you just, a government comes on board they came on the on the back of promises during campaigns, and then when they resume office, when they win the elections and they resume office, you can't see a correlation between their manifestos and the actions that they're taking. Um, for once, and this has to be said, no matter who you support from a political point of view, for once we're seeing a government that campaigned on the basis of certain policy pronouncements and policy promises, and almost every single one of those items are contained in the in, in, in a policy document that they so say will guide and direct, you know, the actions of the government. I think this is very good. It needs to be commended. Now, the, 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 if when the ministers come on board, it will be a disservice to Nigeria for those ministers to, um, to, to, to digress from that plan in any manner, shape, or form. That plan must be a guiding light. It must be the, 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 the source of the policies and pronouncements that this government makes going forward. Um, so no, I do not expect to see any changes. Of course, there will be little tweaks here and there um, you know, from the different you know, champions, like Mr. Lodger Day said. So you have a minister of, um, say, the central bank governor comes on board or the minister of finance. You know, so. There might be, the, the minister might look at some of the components of that plan and say, oh, well, this is good, but why don't we 
approach it in this way. There will definitely be little tweaks there. But if there is a significant departure, then it's a breach of trust. So I think that it's a good thing that we have a plan. It's very important that we see that plan executed, you know, as close to the letter as is possible. What this does is that everybody knows where we're going. Everybody knows why subsidy has been removed. Everybody knows why, you know, VAT has been, is being increased. All of the pain that we're bearing, this is the reason for it, and this is the destination, you know. So, so by the same token, I think I need to charge this government in particular, and especially the president, to understand that he is a leader and he's leading people. He is not a ruler. It is critical to communicate a vision of the destination to those people as you lead them along the way so that they will follow you. Otherwise, you might discover that you think you're a leader and you are going in a direction, you look behind you, nobody's following you, and you discover that you're just taking a stroll in the park. You will fail as a leader. So communication, like Mr. Lodgede said earlier, is absolutely critical, but I think also that that communication needs to come from the president. I would have preferred to have seen in the inauguration speech of the president a vision statement, a clear picture of where the country will be in four years' time with regards to specific indicators you know, within the economy and within the society. That didn't quite happen you know, in a manner that I think would have been more, more powerful and more effective, but um, it's a good thing that we've seen a plan. And one can only hope that the government stays true to that plan as much as possible, you know, as it goes along. Yeah, we have, we have experience of you follow the master plan or you are rooted out, you're kicked out. <laughs> we know where that happens or that yeah. happened uh, in, in this our Nigeria. We hope that it will be replicated at the federal level. But, you know, both of you have talked about communicating with the people. And if you ask an average person... Uh, the question will be that why are they even collecting this so much taxes? How is it going to affect me as a person? We need that to be communicated because if I know that diesel will go up and my life will become unbearable, it doesn't matter where the money goes to. Whether we, we, like I said earlier on, whether the entire world is owing Nigeria rather than we having debts, it doesn't matter if I still go hungry. So let us, let me hear from both of you as we wrap up, you know, uh, the marked advantages of, the, of collecting or adding these taxes to everything that we are going to uh, be using in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, where is the money going to and how is, is it going to affect the common man? Let me I remain with you, Mr. Shokwitan, before I come back to Mr. Alojo. Okay, so, so that's an absolutely critical question that you raise. And I think that this is the part of the equation that the government is getting wrong and that previous governments have gotten wrong. Look, if you are asking people to make this tremendous sacrifices, we need to understand the impact of this policy pronouncement on the lives of people. Lives are changing in, in fundamental ways. People are making sacrifices in fundamental ways. People are changing lifestyle choices as a result of not having alternatives because their income is not increasing, but costs around them, all around them, are going up. You can't ask a people to do that, and you ha they have nothing to show for those sacrifices on the one hand, and then they see you as a leader making them take on those sacrifices, not also making commensurate sacrifices. So this speaks to two things. One, the cost of governance needing to be radically restructured, to be brought down. Um, and two, that the promises that have been made you know, with regards to the deployment of these resources that are being raised. Subsidy removal is a way of raising additional um, freeing up funds for the government. And the government has said, this will go into the improvement of transportation, it will go into the improvement of the power sector, and health and education. These are the things that the president said. Those things must be seen. Now, the, the experience we have had as a people in this country, even if you limit it to just the Fourth Republic, starting from 1999, is that subsidies have been removed, um, if we trace the history, not less than 10 times. And each one of those times, there were promises about what would happen to infrastructure and to social services. Those promises never came to fruition. So this is the challenge. If you are asking people to make these payments, you are putting 75%, 7.5% uh, additional tax on diesel, for example, 
where is the commensurate investment in social infrastructure, social services that will improve the lives, the quality of lives of people? It's missing. So this is something that the government needs to address as a critical matter of urgency. We need to see action and we need to see, you know, it takes years to build a real project, but it takes only a few months to make a pronouncement about it. It takes only a few months to, to, to let people know that you have engaged a contractor or you have commenced the public procurement process, you know, to deploy in real. So those actions need to come as quickly as possible so that the confidence of the people in these policies can be maintained and you will not get a, a revolt on your hands. Okay. Uh, Mr. Oladejo, I, I wanted to ask you to tell us um, what best will be the methods of communicating to the people, but let me digress entirely because of what Mr. Shopperton said, and I'll take very brief comments from you because our time is up, really. Um, before now, we were talking, and in fact, we've seen it, that uh, the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission has approved or at least have, has written a document to say that the political office holders and judges and all that, their salaries will have to go up by 114%. I just want to pick your minds and see how you think about that. In a situation where Nigerians are suffering, Nigerians are trying to adjust, like Mr. Shopperton just said and all that, and then uh, the salaries of uh, political office holders and judges going up by 114%. Two, 200,000 <laughs> that the NLC is asking for, TUC is asking for, yeah. nobody has talked about it. About it. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's not right to say nobody has talked about it. That is currently part of what the tripartite committee uh, of government and NLC um, are, are working on. I see. Yeah. But at the same time, the optics about the 114% increase of, you know, a segment of the society's salary, the optics is very bad. The act or the action in itself, you know, looking over 15 years and taking a review one for the first time in 15 years, the action in itself is not bad. But the timing makes the optics very horrible. Even if this work has been done, of course, the work did not start a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. It must have been a work they've been at for maybe more than one year, you know. You, you hold it close to your chest. You probably address that labor matter first. Mm. And when you have something in that space, then you can bring your own to the table so and say, ah, okay, um, we are doing this for labor. Um, this is also what we think of doing for the political office holders. The one for federal civil service, I think something has been done. So I still see communication as a problem out there. So if, if our president, do you know what I will even do? I will say I don't want salary. Take mm. my salary for the period. Put it in that other project. Because the real problem about uh, 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 cost of governance is actually not inside salary. Mm. It's not inside there. A whole lot of them who afford to say, take that salary. They are in some other things that we must pay attention to. But the optics about 1 and 14% at this time, that optics is... Horrible. Okay, Mr. Shopperton, please, uh, your, own, your own take as well. They, everybody has been talking mm -hmm. about cost of governance, and you mentioned it, and now this one is happening. We've heard the take of Mr. Olodejo, so let me hear you too. Well, I, look, I agree with him 100%. I think it's, it's about the optics. Um, I think that if, you know, the president wants the support of Nigerians, and he needs badly to get the support of Nigerians, he needs... Um, the validation and the legitimacy issue addressed. He needs to lead by example. So taking a salary cut is a better way to go than taking a salary increment when you've just increased everything for everybody else. Um, beyond the salaries, just like Mr. Lodge, the object, I think this is the key thing for me, this would be a takeaway, it's that the cost of governance itself, in terms of the allowances, in terms of the volume, the number of aids that get appointed, in terms of um, things like um, uh, your motorcade, you know, the, the, the entourage that goes with, the, you know, governance and all that. All of these things need to be holistically addressed. The Orosaya report, Orosaya report is still sitting there, you know, gathering dust, harmonization of the MDAs to make government smaller. Lean, mean, efficient government is what we need now. A very productive government. I'm not talking about civil service, you know, sacking or reduction, but a harmonization of government processes to make them more efficient so that for the same Naira, 
we're getting a whole lot more productivity. This is key and it's something that the government needs to look at urgently. Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for being on the program. First of all, uh, Mr. Shokpaton, uh, Principal Partner, Woodridge and Scott Consulting. Thank you for being a part of this program today. Thank you. And to you, Mr. Bolahon Olujede, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, that's where we wrap it up on today's show. But remember our memory verse, as it were. The quote for the day from uh, Vince Lam Lombardi is, Winners never quit, and quitters never win. I'm sure a lot of you have heard that, but this is the man who said it. We do hope that you will not quit. And above all, don't take your life, no matter how difficult things might be. Let's do it again tomorrow. My name is Nyamgul Agaji.